Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for bringing us together to make us learn more about Jesus. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we hear more about him, our faith in him will increase in Jesus' name. And we pray everything is brought for total satisfaction in his sufficiency. You impart into every life in Jesus' name. Bless us here. Bless us everywhere. And we pray that this gathering together, retreat, concentrating on the all-sufficient Jesus will be a benefit to everyone. Make your word powerful as it penetrates every heart and everything you have, everything you've done for every one of us will be beneficiaries in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. To get today, as we begin our retreat, our Easter retreat, here and everywhere, and we're learning about Jesus. We'll be talking about Jesus from the beginning to the end. And today we're looking at him as the abiding builder and, be, and the bridegroom of the church. We need to answer the question about who Jesus is in Matthew chapter 16. Reading from verse 15. He says unto them, here is the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, asking the question, but whom say ye that I am? And then in verse 16, we're told that Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They are giving the ideas of what other people say, that is other people in the nation, other people in Israel. What they said about Jesus, they said, it's one of the prophets that died and came back. They said, it's even like Jeremiah, it's like all the others that have come. But those, those answers were wrong. And many people around us, many people in every nation, they have the idea as to who Jesus is. And as they might in your own community, as they might in your own nation say, here is what we think about Jesus. Here is what we think Jesus is. The Lord is now taking the question away from the public. He's taking the question away from the people that have opinions and ideas. He's saying, in reality, who do you say that I am? Here, like Peter, we have to answer, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, a great revelation. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou. When we really reveal what we know about Jesus, when we comprehend what we know about Jesus, when we confess what we know about Jesus, the blessing then comes upon us. It says, Blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed each unto thee. And what we get from flesh and blood from men, from authorities, from religious people, from whoever, from the libraries of the world. What men have written, what the flesh and blood have written, that's not sufficient. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. But my Father, which is in heaven, we need to have the revelation of the Father. You come to the Lord, he makes you his own son, his own child. He makes you a, a, a citizen of the kingdom. And now that you have the mark of a real child of God, you can answer because the Father now reveals to you that this is so Christ, our Lord and Savior is. And then you can rejoice in the fact that it is not flesh and blood, that has revealed this unto you but the Father who is in heaven. And then in verse 18 it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, which rock? The rock of his confession, the rock of who Christ is. 
upon this cross that you know me as Christ, you know me as the Savior, as the Lord, as the one that the Father has sent to build a sanctuary, to build his church upon that rock, I will build my church. It's not building the church on Peter. It's not building the church on any apostle. It's not building the church on any founder of the church. He builds the church, his own church, on the rock of the confession that thou art Christ. Upon that rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. As we come to talk about Jesus today, number one, I'm talking about Jesus, the abiding builder and bridegroom of the church. The abiding builder is the one still building, is abiding. And is the bridegroom, is still the bridegroom of the church. The abiding builder and bridegroom of the church. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, number one, Jesus A. Number two, Jesus B. Number three, Jesus C. A, Jesus, the advocate for saints and sinners. Jesus is the advocate for saints and sinners. B, Jesus is the builder of the sanctuary that is the church of saints. Number three, Jesus, the captain of our salvation and sanctification. Look at number one. Number one, Jesus is the advocate of the saints and of the sinners. We're looking at three things here. Number one, Jesus is the advocate for the saints and for the sinners. Number two, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And number three, Jesus is the ancient of days. Speak them up one by one. Number one, Jesus, the advocate. The advocate for sinners and the advocate for saints. The advocate for you. The advocate for me. He is the one that stands and that sees at the side of the Father. And he is making supplication for you, advocating for you, and defending you, and defending your right in the Lord. Look at that in First John chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Jesus, the advocate for saints, and sinners, it tells us in 4 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, this six right I unto you. It's writing to you. It's giving you revelation, definite understanding about who Jesus is. Little children, those who have come to the Lord, babes in the Lord and converts to the Lord, and those who have been taught by the grace of God, they're no more outside the kingdom. They are inside the kingdom. They have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ before you, before you can become a child in the kingdom. A citizen of the kingdom before you can become a person that even the heavenly father will recognize and say, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's a child of God. You would have repented, turned away from every sin. And you are not practicing sin, the sin you have dropped, and the sins you have repented of, you are not practicing them in the secret. You are in the secret, in the open, in the private, in the public, a real child of God, having the nature of God, and living as a child of God ought to live. And then you can come in to that group of people, the little children, the lively children, the liberated children. These things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, if any man sin, is talking about now a large congregation of the children of God, that normally we should not sin. Daily, we should not sin. We should not sin habitually. 
We should not just be a nominal believer, a nominal Christian saying, I am, and we're not. Saying, I belong to God, and yet our life, our character, our behavior shows we're not of God. It says we should not sin, but if any man sin, if he sins because he's careless, because he's prayerless, because he's faithless, if he sins because he's forgotten who he is and who the Lord has made him, he says, if not when, as if, when you sin, like when you eat, when you take your bath, when you, not when, but if, occasionally, if it so happens, accidentally, if it so happens, carelessly, if it happens, if any man sin, we, all of us, children of God, have an advocate or the father, advocate. That's it, the one who pleads for us, the one who restores us, the one who puts the mercy of God and the goodness of God in place, and the one who pleads for the Father, he belongs to me. And because he belongs to me, he has seen, I'm still his Savior. He can call upon you, Father, in my name, and you will forgive him, I will forgive him. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And now he can exchange his righteousness with our unrighteousness. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And he, the advocate, is the propitiation for our sin, the one responsible for the cleansing of our sin. It's responsible for the covering of our sin from the view of the Father. He's responsible for the cancellation of our sin, that they're no more remembered against us. It's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. Ours the saints, ours, the children of God, but also for the sins of the whole world, of the world are seen. He is the advocate for the children of God. He is the advocate for the people outside the kingdom for sinners as well. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24. Look at this. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, but which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. He has not entered into the earthly tabernacle, into the earthly sanctuary, but he has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us to appear as our advocate, as our defender, as the one that pleads for us, pleads with God on your behalf, on my behalf, on the behalf of all saints. And you remember that when you have a need. You remember that when there's any guilt, any condemnation in your heart, you go to God the Father and you plead because the advocate Christ is already pleading for you. That's why it says in Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You have faith in his blood. He shed the blood for you. He took your sins away. And the entrance of the Lord, the proclamation of the Lord still stands. When I see the blood, 
I will pass over them. And your faith in that blood, in the blood of Jesus, your faith in the death of Christ, your faith in what Christ has done, makes you to come to the Lord now. And you say, some God has set forth to be a propitiation, the covering for your sin, the cleansing of your sin, the cancellation of your sin through faith. In his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Look at verse 26. It says, to declare, I say, at this time, the right is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier, the justifier, the justifier. The one that acquits you and sets you free and says you are not under guilt and condemnation anymore. It justifies you, not because you are just. He is just. And then is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In Jesus. He is our advocate. And this morning, as you call on the Lord and you plead, the fact, not that you are good, not that you are better than other people, but you plead on the basis that Christ is your advocate. All your sins will be forgiven in Jesus' name. You'll be totally set free from them and the power of that indwelling sin, the Lord will break and you'll become a new creature. And if you're a new creature in Christ already, it will be affirmed and confirmed in your life that you are a child of God and the strength, the grace to live victoriously in the Lord, the Lord will make abide with you in Jesus' name. Number two here, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. The author and the finisher of our faith. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1, is the author and the finisher of our faith. Is the originator. And he is the consummate power of faith in our lives. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about was so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside. We've seen a cloud of witnesses of Enoch, of Abel, of Abraham, of Noah. We've seen a cloud of witnesses of the people that believed in the Lord, even the whole of the children of Israel. We've seen them. At the time of believing in the Lord and what God was with them. And I haven't seen the cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. Seen the weight. It weighs on your heart. Weighs on your conscience. Weighs on your spirit. Weighs people down. Guilt. Weighs people down. Condemnation weighs people down. Sin. What the consequence of sin weighs people down. And when you are weighed down, it's like you're carrying a bag of cement at your back. To run the race becomes impossible. Not just difficult, impossible. When you are weighed down by the guilt, by the condemnation, you are weighed down by the expectation of the judgment to come. You are so weighed down that even your joy is the joy of a hypocrite that does not last. Because the weight of sin, common sin, the weight of sin, habitual sin, the weight of secret sin, of the condemnation, it says we lay that aside. The weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. As we walk through life, you'll know the things that usually bring you down. You know the things that usually get you back into the old life. It might be 
the habit of lying, of deception, of hypocrisy that always comes at you and now you are down. It might be the weight of anger, that habitual attitude of anger that a little thing happens and you flare up. That is the scene that has been coming over and over and over your life. And it's the scene that so easily besets you. It might be unbelief. Unbelief, you have the promise of God, you have the goodness of God, and you have uh, the provision of Christ at Calvary. And everything, every time you have a challenge, it might not challenge you, a big challenge, that weight and habitual unbelief then comes upon your life. And you remember why the children of Israel were not able to get to the promised land. They could not enter in because of unbelief. And that unbelief has become a wage in your life. The sin which does so easily beset us. It might be a sin defilement of the flesh. The works of the flesh now are manifest. And then he tells us what those works of the flesh are. That your flesh takes the better part of you. Your flesh and the works of the flesh, they take the better part of your life. That as you're running and running and running, temptation to the flesh comes, you forget yourself. Maybe it's that, that is the besetting sin in your life. It says now that we recognize Christ and the author and the finisher of our faith, we lay all that aside. Let us run with patience, with perseverance, the race that is set before us. You don't take a break all the time. You know, a race is set before you. And you're running and running and running that race every day, every time. There's always something to do, to live in the grace of God, in the goodness of God, every day of your life that's running the race that is set before you. And now in verse 2, verse 2 tells us that we're looking unto Jesus every time, looking unto Jesus. You don't take your sight away from the Lord because the author and the finisher of your faith. You're always looking on him. Look unto me, O ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Look up unto me, and be ye steadfast. Look up unto me, and be set in the way of the Lord. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Any kind of faith that comes from the brain, fake. Any kind of faith that comes from human aggression, aggressiveness. I believe, I believe. But it's not given. It's not generated. It's not burst from heaven. All that cannot sustain you. It's the faith he gives us. The faith he gives us to know that he is the savior. The faith he gives you to know that he is your sanctifier. The faith he gives you. And you know that this is not a human, a human generated thing. It's God himself that gives you this. And Jesus is the author and the finisher. And the author and the one that makes that faith to continue in you. Looking Unto Jesus every time. On the stormy sea, looking unto Jesus. In the time of temptation, looking unto Jesus. In the time of trial, looking unto Jesus. In the time of sickness, looking unto Jesus. In the time of persecution, looking unto Jesus. In the time of confusion, looking unto Jesus. 
That is the guarantee of our staying in the faith, of our steadfastness in the faith, of our sustainers in the faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And we have a cross to you, a cross to carry a cross to bear. And as we look unto Jesus, he is the one that gives us the strength, the endurance, the ability to endure our cross to despise sin, the shame. And the people that will try to reproach you or cast as passions on you and make you feel little and make you feel small and make you feel insignificant but we look unto Jesus because he endured such great shame and reproach and now he is seated down, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at number three here. Number three, he is the ancient of Days, the ancient of days. We're told in, uh, in Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to God the Father came to God the Almighty, came to the ancient of days, and he brought him, the Son of Man, Jesus, near before him, God the Father, the ancient of days. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, all nations, all languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. He's talked to us about God the Father being the ancient of days. Now we come to verse 21. In verse 21, I beheld, and the same hand made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Look at verse 22 now. Until the ancient of days came. And that's referring to Jesus. Verse 14 is referring to God the Father. You understand? God the Almighty says, I am Alpha and Omega. And then Christ says the same thing. I am Alpha and Omega. The one that was and is and is to come. And the Father is the ancient of days. So the Son is the ancient of days too. And he says until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Your time is coming. Our time is coming. With Christ, we're going to possess the kingdom in Jesus' name. Look at point number two. In point number two, Jesus is the builder. In point number one is a the advocate. Now in point number two, he is the builder of the church of the saints. Three things we're looking at. Number one, Jesus, the bishop and the shepherd of our soul. Number two, Jesus, the bridge of life. Number three, Jesus, the brightness of the Father's glory. Look at number one. Number one, Jesus, the bishop and the shepherd of our souls. Look at First Peter chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 24, who his own self, talking about Christ, 
who is so self bear our sins. He bore our sin, the punishment of our sin, all that he bore. The blemish that came to us as a result of sinfulness, all that he bore, who is own self a savior, who is own self as a substitute, who is own self as the final sacrifice, who is own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we children of God now to sin not dead in sins anymore unbelievers are dead in sin believers are dead to sin a difference a wide difference between those sins those who are dead in sin they commit sin, they are dead. They don't even know that anything is happening. Their conscience is dead. Their mind, dead. Their personality, dead. They sin without even feeling any guilt or condemnation. They are dead in sin. The believer is dead to sin. That means sin may come it doesn't interest him anymore. It's like a man who is physically dead. You bring a bottle of alcohol, doesn't affect him. You bring cigarette, doesn't affect him. You bring all those hard drugs and marijuana, doesn't affect him. You bring uh, any kind of evil thing he was used to. When he was still alive, it doesn't affect him now. He is dead to them. Dead to alcohol, dead to sinfulness, dead to transgression. So we are dead to sin. We should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. And then he tells us in verse 25, it says, for we, for ye, were a sheep going astray, but now have returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. The bishop of your soul is now the one watching over your soul. It's now the one preventing your soul from going back into the old dirty life. The bishop and the shepherd of our soul. In Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 20. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, it tells us now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of his, of the everlasting covenant. What does he do now? Because he is the bishop and the shepherd of our soul. Verse 21, it says, Make you perfect in every good work. As human beings, a lot of imperfections in our lives. Even our knowledge is imperfect. Our attitude is imperfect. Our walking is imperfect. Our trying to live out the commandments of the Lord, imperfect. And cry, Jesus, the bishop and shepherd of our soul, is the one that has come. He comes into our lives. He says, this is imperfect in your life. The way we talk, the way we act, the relationships we have, the interactions we have, imperfect. He says, I observe, although you are born again, although you have come into the kingdom of God, look at this area, imperfect. Look at that area, imperfect. And he now comes that will make you perfect in every good work to do. His will, walking in you, that which is well-pleasing, in his sight, then it says, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, 
Amen. We're coming to number two. Number two, he is the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And look at John chapter 6, verse 48. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. When we come to him, we're born again. He gives us life, eternal life. Just like when you were born, naturally, you had life, like human life. But you know what? From that time, you had life, the natural life. You need to be fed every day because it is the food, the milk, the meals, the bread, everything now summarized as bread that maintains your life that you got at birth. The same thing when you are born again. You are born into the kingdom of God because of what Christ has done. What maintains that life? Eternal life. What maintains that life? The life of God in man. What maintains that life is Jesus, the bread of life. And he says the words I say unto you, the life and their spirit. Look at verse 63. John 6, verse 63. He tells us in verse 63, he says, The flesh, it is the spirit that quickeneth, that makes alive, that makes the life you have vital. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, the spirit and their life. It's that that makes you to keep on living in the strength of the Lord. Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 4. In Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That is by the bread that feeds the human life. That one sustains the human life that you got when you were born into this world. But in the word of God, the promises of God, the proclamations of God, the provision of God revealed in his word that you have and that you take in, that you accept, that you believe, that you digest, that you meditate on, that you apply to your life, that you live by spiritually, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Look at number three here. Number three is talking about the brightness of the Father's glory. The brightness of the Father's glory. Remember, we're, to remember, we're talking about the all-sufficient Jesus. He's sufficient for every area of our lives. In Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says, being the brightness of his glory. It says, Christ is the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person. It says, by that being the brightness of his glory and the express image of the personality of the almighty God is now upholding all things by the word of his power. The word of his power. And there's power in that word. And it's the power in the word of Christ, in the word of Jesus, that upholds you so that you don't fall. That upholds you so you don't look back. That upholds you so you don't backslide. That upholds you so you don't compromise. And you still stand firm in the word of the Lord, upholding all things and all people by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down 
on the right hand of the majesty on high. He will uphold you. I said he will uphold you. He will sustain you that everything he has done, everything he is for you, you will enjoy, you will experience in the name of the Lord. It tells us in John chapter 1, reading from verse 14, we're talking about Jesus and we're told that and the word was made flesh. Christ, the eternal word, was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father and is full of grace and truth. Are you looking for grace? It's full of grace and truth. Are you searching for truth? The truth that transforms every life. The truth that saves everyone. The truth that prepares you as an earthly person to become the heavenly candidate he is the one that is full of truth. And that truth saves us. That truth sanctifies us. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. He purges us. He sanctifies us. He cleanses us. He changes the human nature to become a godly nature. He removes the vice and he puts virtue in our life. He makes us have the very image of Christ in us. And he does that by the truth that sanctifies. It's the sufficient truth. We don't, any other, we don't need any other truth to go to heaven. Only the truth that came from Christ, a savior, a sanctifier, a healer, a baptizer in the Holy Ghost, the truth that comes from the coming King. That's the truth we need that prepares us for the coming of the Lord. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In First John chapter 3, reading from verse 5, when this Christ, Jesus, when he comes into us and he lives within us, Look at what he does in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever Abideth in him, sinneth not. The people that sin and sin and sin, they have to go out of Christ before they can continue in that habit of sinfulness. Those who abide in him, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I, Christ, the Savior, will come in unto him. And when he comes in unto you, then he purifies you, he purges you, and he gives you the power to live a victorious life, a gracious life. He makes you to live a life aboard but above reproach, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 
whosoever sinneth. He just said, I became born again. He's been sinning all the way before sin is born again. After being born again, the old life still continues. He sins with the mouth. He sins with his eyes. He sees with his ears what he hears. He sees with his hand. He sees with his feet everywhere he goes. He sees by what he puts on. He sees by what he takes in. Whosoever is like that. And he continues. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him. Neither known him. Verse 7. In verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he that committeth, committeth, committeth. That's what he does. He's taking it almost as a full-time job. He committed and committed sin. It's something he does daily. He does it every time. If he has not seen today, he says something is missing. There's something I should have done, which I have not done. I have not committed sin today. strange. For him, not committing sin is strange. It's abnormal. He must do something to show that Christ is not living expressly in him. And it says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Somebody say amen. amen. He comes into our lives so that he can destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. The old life is gone. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. The violence of the past passed away. The aggressiveness of the past gone away. The lion spirit fighting, fighting, violence all the time passed away. And the nature of Nebuchadnezzar furious, angry, hateful, all the time, all that is passed away. It's born again. It's born anew. It's born from above. Because of that, life changes. That's what Christ is able to do. He will do it in every life. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Like the fish cannot fly, like the bird cannot swim, because the nature is now changed, the life is now changed. He cannot commit sin. You know why? He doesn't want to. He has a new nature. He has a new life. He has a new character. He does not want to go back to the gutter to swallow up the old vomit. Life is different now. He cannot sin because he's born of God. I am born of God. Let heaven hear you. Let the devil hear so he will know who you are. And the sins of the past will not take hold of my life. See it for yourself. 
the sin of the past. Say it aloud. The sin of the past will no more take hold of my life. Amen. Heaven says amen to your proclamation in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. A, the advocate. B, the bishop and the builder of the sanctuary of saints. Number three, now see Jesus, the captain of our salvation and sanctification. Jesus, the captain of our salvation and sanctification. We're looking in at Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things... And by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. He'll bring you to glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. The captain of their salvation. That's Christ. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Have you noticed plural sufferings? When he was beaten with those tribes, suffering. When the crown of thorns was laid on his head, suffering. When he was nailed to the cross, suffering. When he shouted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Suffering. When those be unbelievers taunted him, ah, he says, his Christ, let him come from the cross, and they will believe him. Suffering. When they said, he said, you'll build the temple in three days, okay, let him do that now. Suffering. All that he suffered from the time he was even born into this world, the suffering in the mind, in his soul, in his spirit, on his body, all the sins of humanity laid upon him, he suffered, and the captain is the captain of the salvation of our soul made perfect through sufferings. It tells us in verse 11, it says, For he that sanctifies, and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Three things we're looking at. Number one, he is the Christ of God. Number two, the cornerstone of our salvation. Number three, the captain of our salvation. Look at number one, Christ of God. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 20, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. The Christ appointed by God, Messiah. The Christ anointed by God. And the Christ that is approved of God. You are the Christ of God. Appointed, anointed, and approved of God. Let's look at number two here. Number two, he is the cornerstone of our salvation to build anything and don't make it stand straight and stand firm. You need the cornerstone. And Jesus is the cornerstone of our salvation. In Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 11, this is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. 
at the cornerstone. In verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. Every country is under heaven. Every nation is under heaven. Every sinner is under heaven. Every citizen of the world is under heaven. And there's no other name for salvation. No other name. No other power. No other sacrifice. And there is no other assurance from anywhere. There is no salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained. In the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be ashamed, shall not be confounded. Did you say amen to that? No shame again. And there is no judgment anymore. Once you believe on that cornerstone of our salvation. We're looking at Hebrews, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19 and 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but citizens, fellow citizens, with the saints and of the household of God. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And when your life is built on him, the cornerstone. It will hold you firm and steadfast, safe and secured forever in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three he is the captain of our salvation. The captain of our salvation. Look at Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 9. It says, But we see Jesus. By faith, you see more of Jesus today. It says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels by putting out her flesh for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The death you should have died, he has tasted death for you. And that death will not come upon your life anymore. Yeah. Spiritual death taken away. Yeah. The second, final, eternal death taken away. Yeah. And now you can pass from earth to heaven without tasting the judgment of God. Free. Free by Christ, a Savior, final sacrifice, substitute, you're free in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering is the perfect savior, is the perfect substitute, is the perfect redeemer, 
and he comes to you today as you come to him and everything in your life that will hinder you from getting to heaven he'll take everything away heaven that's your destination and you're going there not because of you, not because you're good, not because everything was all right with you. No, you are imperfect. But Christ, the perfect Savior, is now your Savior. The captain of your salvation. The captain of my salvation. Where are you? Stand up on your feet and say, Lord, here I am. How I thank God. That Jesus is my advocate. How I praise the Lord. That Jesus is the bishop and shepherd of my soul. How I praise the Lord. That Jesus is the captain of my salvation. Accept it. Believe it. Confess it. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, here I am. And I surrender. I submit myself completely unto you. Talk to the Lord. Open your